Arrakis Jiun Book Club Chapter 3 A Humanity Test Debriefing Welcome to Peppers and Glowworms, a channel dedicated to hot chili peppers and coldly glowing glowworms. <coughs> Well, the last two episodes were a bit long, so I will try to keep this one a little bit shorter, which should be comparatively easy because it's only uh, not even 10 pages in the version that I have. So uh, let's try with the short summary at first. We have only three protagonists in this chapter, namely the Reverend Mother Gaius, Helen Mohiam and the Lady Jessica. And later on, Paul is joining them. At first, uh, the Lady Jessica is chewed out by the Reverend Mother for having the audacity to bear a son to the Duke uh, when she was ordered to bear a daughter. You know, uh, you thought only of your Duke's desire for a son. The plan of the Bene Gesserit was originally to uh, wed uh, the Atreides' daughter to an Harkonnen heir. Well, they may lose both bloodlines now. And then there's a little bit of world building hidden in their conversation. They talk about, or rather the Reverend Mother uh, lectures the Lady Jessica about their political environment with the three-point civilization, the imperial household and the great houses of the Lancerat and the guild with the monopoly on interstellar transport and the Missionaria Protectiva uh, comes up, uh, which uh, I think I may do a separate video just about this uh, points of world building and the plants within plants that are connected to all these. And what's also interesting in this chapter is that contrary to the uh, um, adaptations to the screen, I think, here we can see the nicer side of the Reverend Mother Mohiam um, when her voice softens and it is made clear that the Lady Jessica um, is as dear to her as her own daughter and although she does not let that interfere with her duty. And, yeah, of course, in the uh, prequel novels by the son of Frank Herbert and another author, she actually is uh, the daughter of the Gaius Helen Mohiam. Uh, but let's not talk about those novels here. It's also, um, again, a little bit repetition about the theme of humans versus animals, that uh, the rule is humans must never submit to animals and that an, uh, humans are almost always lonely. Yeah, and later on there's also the, the point of the uh, purpose brought up again, the terrible purpose in this case, and the purpose of the willow. But uh, at first they ask Paul back in and basically he just recounts his most recent prophetic dream where he talks uh, about the literal girl of his dreams. He doesn't know her name yet. He basically just recounts his vision in more detail. And the chapter ends with, again, the nicer side of the Reverend Mother when she advises Jessica that she should train her son about the voice. She says he already has a good start, but she should not adhere to the regular order of training and tell him teach him about the voice right now because it would be very beneficial for his survival. Yeah, and about the Quiz at Sadarak, the Reverend Mother sees the possibility that Paul might be the sought after individual but not more. It's it possible, doubtful but possible. And they decide that they may be able to save Paul and this quote I think comes up in some of the screen adaptations. But for the father, nothing. So, eh, as it was already implied, the Duke seems to be somewhat screwed and he's doomed. Yeah, and also, uh, again, the nicer side of the Reverend Mother, when she leaves them, uh, Jessica can spot some tears on her cheeks. Yeah, and that's, she finds that very unnerving. But again, it shows that she has a nicer side to her, not just this terrible old hag. Okay then, let's move through the different segments. The actual quote, 
I tell the girl you came and put a stamp of strangeness on me. That's when uh, Paul tells them about the vision, what he told to the girl of his dreams. And this seems like an apt description of what the Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohiam did to Paul. She came and, uh, oh, you're kind of strange, man. Yeah, from other memory, uh, any other common sci-fi tropes that I want to talk about? Hmm? Not really, did not spot anything uh, that I could not deal with better in other parts. Mm. Mary Sue Paul, Paul's abilities, titles and such, not really much new. It's confirmed that he has prophetic visions that are quite accurate and it is confirmed that he was trained in the ways of the Bene Gesserit. One thing that comes up is one of his many titles or names, uh, apart from Paul Atreides, which is Usul. He doesn't know yet that it's supposed to be his name. He first thinks that it's a misunderstanding about his home planet. Oh, let me check. Um, it's a, also a famous quote in, from the adaptations, I think. At least I have it in my mind like this. I think mostly the David Lynch version where it is repeated ad nauseum, I think. <laughs> Tell me about the waters of your home world, Usul. And at first he thinks, uh, oh, that's strange. My home world is Caledon. I've never even heard of a planet called Usul. And uh, in this conversation he thinks that, ha, huh, maybe she was calling me Usul. And that is correct, but he doesn't know yet what it means or that it definitely is his title or name. But that will come up later. Okay. Were the great sandworms of Dune mentioned by any of their names? Huh. Again, not at all. No worm signs. So I will not have to or get to consume some spicy little bit like a dried chili pepper or some hot sauce or powder. But I have read ahead a bit. And I can tell you, this is the last chapter without worm signs. And in the next chapter, I have a strong feeling that we will have the first worm sign. So, until then, goodbye.